Hey there, it's me, Dr. Daniel. And in this video, I'm going to be discussing the virome, the microbiome, uh, our internal and external environments, and what it means with respect to the current pandemic that we're navigating ourselves through. Arthur C. Clarke famously said that there are two possibilities uh, that exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we're not. Certainly, scientists over hundreds of years have been fascinated by the idea that life could exist in all shapes and sizes all across the universe. And as exciting as that may be, exploring the cosmos and all of its grandeur, there's equal discoveries and understanding of the microcosm and realizing that we within our own human microcosm, we are not alone. Uh, it's well understood now that the planet that we live on is inhabited with organisms that we can visibly see. And then there's billions upon billions, quadrillions of organisms that we cannot see. Now, the quadrillions of organisms that are part of the biomes that exist on the planet, right? What's a biome? A biome is a collection of plants and animals that have common characteristics and even objectives within the, the environment that they're living in. Now, the earth itself is a biome. Uh, relative to the solar system, it's parked, right? And, and there's this uh, uh, it, there's set of ingredients for all these things. The earth has oceans with, with the ocean has its own biome, the soil, the rivers, the lakes, all the organisms that are walking, swimming, flying, floating on this planet, each themselves have their own micro internal biomes that exist within the greater biomes. Now, of course, we have all heard about the microbiome, Micro meaning small, biome again, the collection of organisms within common characteristics and objectives living in an environment. Uh, we are now understanding how the microbiome influences our health in profound ways. We now know that our body has individual biomes. You've got an oral microbiome, you've got an ocular microbiome. There's even a vaginal and a testicular microbiome. All of these individual biomes or collection of organisms, including bacteria, fungi, parasites, they all contribute to influencing positively or negatively our central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord. The microbiomes of our body influence how we digest food, literally how you extract energy from the food that you consume. Uh, they help us to extract nutrients from the food that we consume. The organisms inside our body that are not us, right? They're not human. These other organisms themselves produce nutrients within our body. They produce compounds that our bodies in turn use to function. These organisms provide for immune function and resilience. Uh, they become first line protectors of our innate immune barriers, such as our skin, our nose and our throat, the mucus layers, the lungs, you know, protecting you from things that you breathe, your blood brain barrier and, and the most popular immune barrier, the intestinal barrier. And if you really want to understand your health and your physiology, you should really pay attention to the harmony of these biomes. For example, if you have disruption of a biome that makes up your nose and your throat, the nasopharynx barrier, you can end up with leaky nose or leaky throat, and that can manifest as symptoms of rhinitis or sinusitis or chronic ear, nose, and throat infections, mucus production. Uh, if you have disruption of your skin biome, you can end up with leaky skin, and it manifests as symptoms of rashes, dermatitis, right? All these different types of skin conditions, eczema, acne, psoriasis, when it's really bad. If you have disturbance of the pulmonary barrier, your lungs literally lined up with cells that protect you every time you breathe. If there's disruption there, you can end up with asthma, chronic respiratory issues, uh, susceptibility to airborne infections or things that are in our environment. What about your blood brain barrier? If you have permeability of your blood brain barrier or disruption of this barrier, uh, inflammation can ensue and this can manifest as depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, cognitive or other brain based disorders. And then finally, of course, we've got the intestinal barrier. Uh, and if our intestinal microbiome is disrupted, 
Well, given the fact that food is the one, one of the most powerful forms of medicine that you could ever put into your body, the way that we fuel our body and all the organisms that live within it that require this fuel, shit gets pretty dicey if you're not taking care of it. And that's, you know, when you end up with leaky gut. Now, already there are strong connections between the gut and the brain. There's a gut to skin access, a gut to hormone access. There's a gut to eye access. Uh, the gut influences immune function and capacity, our lungs, our detoxification centers. It's the hub uh, where lots of action is occurring. And if this becomes disrupted, you're going to be in for a long ride and it's not going to end well. Now, if you understand all of that I just shared, then you understand how compounds, whether it's intentional or unintentional, can come into our body and disrupt these biomes. And if we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture, if we consider the biomes we physically live in, the general external environment, the part of the world that you live in, literally where you live, the country or the city, the specific external environment, right? Literally where you dwell and the health of the environmental biome, you can begin to realize the connections between your health and the health of the planet and how they're intimately connected. And just as antibiotics create disruption and disharmony for our microbiome, compounds, chemicals from industrial practices create disruption for the Earth's biomes. And how does that influence our body? Well, one major way is the obvious nutritional depletion occurring in our food supply. You know, it's no secret that nutrient levels within our whole foods are dramatically lower than they were decades ago. And do you think that it's possible that these lower nutrients in our food are negatively impacting our health? And this is assuming that you're eating whole foods, right, which already are, 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 are depleted. Now, industrial farming practices consist of stripping topsoil, uh, chemically inducing vegetation, basically medicating crops and spraying the soil with antibiotic-like compounds such as glyphosate or Roundup, which is a chemical that disrupts bacterial metabolic pathways. This is known as the uh, shikimate pathway, which results in disease and dysfunction in bacteria, fungi, algae, other organisms that all help to create healthy living soil and provide nutrients for the soil in the first place. So if the biome, the collection of bacteria, fungus, protozoans, algae, amoebas, all of these microorganism friends of ours who all serve to synergistically create healthy soil, nutrients for that soil that, that, that our food, you know, literally where our food grows from, whether it's plants or other animals take it in, which in turn consume, uh, you know, becomes dysfunctional. How do you think that that impacts our body? So here we find ourselves disrupting the harmony of the biomes and artificially growing crops that look like food, but lack the very essence of what food should contain, nutrients. Nutritional deficiencies are at the heart of most chronic health conditions. There's no question there. Together with physical inactivity, eating an energy rich, uh, think high calorie, low nutrient foods, standard American diet, uh, or a nutrient poor diet predisposes our species humans to many chronic diseases, including type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, hormone imbalances, and other brain-based disorders. Now, the industrial practices that we have in place are literally unsustainable for life on our planet. Now, one, you know, none of what I've just said is new science, none of it. This is all well-established in the literature. It's all based on decades of research in the microbiome and the biomes of our planet. The virome is a newer concept, and yet quite a bit, you know, it's, 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 there, there's quite a bit uh, of interesting data that has come out uh, over the last few years that allows us to now understand how viruses interact with various organisms across all species. And this includes bacteria, fungus, parasites, plants, and other animals. Realize that viruses infect these other or are part of these other biomes. Viruses are not living organisms. Um, so they're not part of the microbiome, right? Anything part of the biome is gonna be living. Viruses are not living. Rather, they are tiny fragments of genetic information uh, that is secreted 
by a living organism, such as bacteria, fungus, parasites, humans, and other animals and plants. Life itself is literally exuding this genomic information that is shared across all species. It's pretty cool how, how these genetic bits of data are uploaded and downloaded across species. And as we dive deeper into human genomics, we can start to see how viruses contribute to the building blocks of life itself. What we are now seeing is that more than 50% of the 20,000 genes that make up your genome, humans or other similar animals, are made up of viral inserts that have been injected literally into our own genome. Let me repeat that. 50% of the 20,000 genes that make up our, our genome are made up of viral inserts that injected themselves into our genome. If you really grasp that concept, then you begin to realize that viruses are not here to attack us. They're not here to cause problems for our body, but they're here to provide genomic updates, transfer of information across the biomes. Now, not every virus we come into contact with is going to be inserted into our genome. You know, our body, as well as other species, are always looking for adaptive or regenerative qualities. Uh, this is part of evolution. We're looking for things that are going to help things to be better. And this is a process that happens over millions of years. And it has resulted in certain genetic information being selected and constantly being refined within itself to help the organism to exist optimally within the environment. I mean, how cool is that? It's pretty interesting. We now know that at least 10% of the human genome is inserted directly by retroviruses. Uh, one of the most scary, of course, is HIV. And what's interesting is why is it that there are humans that are walking around with HIV, but they never develop the disease AIDS? This suggests the significance of these viruses and how they can influence our genetics, both positively or negatively. Now, a great example is the placental function of mammals. Uh, the placental formation literally how we create placenta, right? Which then allows you to have a, a baby. Uh, placental formation is reliant on a retrovirus gene uh, insert that happened in mammals millions of years ago. And if it were not for that, we would not exist. What this means is that we wouldn't have developed the capacity of a placenta if it weren't for these retroviruses. We wouldn't have stem cells uh, and its function if it weren't for viral genetic inserts. Scientists have discovered that uh, an RNA virus millions of years ago um, basically inserted itself into mammalian genomics to allow for stem cells to basically uh, interact, to change its cell type and be able to become any other cell that the genome can actually express. In our body, we have cells, right? Billions of cells that make up specific tissues that then come together to make up specific organs. Let's say your gallbladder. You know, the gallbladder contains cells that within it, literally the DNA within your gallbladder cells have all the instructions to create any other cell in the body. But all the gallbladder cells will stay as gallbladder cells. They stay in their lanes, right? Basically, there's solid yellow lines that prevent the gallbladder cells from switching lanes. The stem cell, however, because of the introduction of this retrovirus millions of years ago, allowed it to change its transcription uh, to end up becoming any other cell. And this viral genetic code allowed for the stem cell to change its lanes, to be able to hop over. And because it was such a strong positive adaptation, it was selected and now we have pluripotent stem cells. How amazing is that? Now, what I'm telling you here is that we are reliant on the genetic information passed from the environment via viruses, collectively known as the virome. Viruses are not our enemy, okay? For, for hundreds of years, old science, old doctors, uh, dogmatic ideology, we've been making this mistake of attacking microorganisms, uh, whether intentional or unintentional. And, and viruses are simply genotic, genomic information that's wrapped in an envelope that can move around across species of living organisms and ultimately help those species to download information from their environment that can actually be helpful or promote adaptation. 
Now, viruses are very different than uh, exosomes. And exosomes are these biomolecular nanostructures that are released from our cells. Uh, they carry specific biomolecular information that can be released by cells within the body, internally or externally, and can absolutely influence other organisms. These uh, vesicles, these exosomes, are actively secreted by most cells and exist in most body fluids. Uh, they exist in your blood, in your saliva, in your breast milk and sperm. Obviously, we all know that you, you know, a mom can take information from her environment and her, her body processes that. She, she literally exudes exosomes through the breast milk that then is transferred into her child. And that allows her child to successfully adapt to the environment, given that everything is good, right? Everything is working the way it needs to be working. Right now, my body, right now as I speak, I'm releasing exosomes, small packets of information that gives information of what's going on inside my body, which genes are being turned on or off. And this information can be transferred to other organisms around my environment, including other humans, the other people that live here in my house, the, the plants, the pets, the other animals that I've got, the microcellular organisms. How fascinating is that? All these exosomes from my body are, are connecting to everything else in my environment, giving these other organisms information to help it to understand what is working and what is not working. Now, if I'm stressed out, if I'm toxic or something bad is happening internally, there are signals that can be sent out and absorbed by other entities. And it's a sort of alert or a detection system that provides insight into what's happening. Now, this is very different from a virus. Exosomes are nonspecific and constantly circulating in and around our environment. We're in an ocean of them uh, with no specific purpose, whereas viruses are more specific and have a very specific intentional delivery system uh, of its target host cell. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, right? This is a virus that specifically attaches to the ACE2 receptors in the human body. The ACE2 receptor is expressed in our lung, our vascular systems, kidneys, your heart. Now, as ACE2 receptors take in this viral genetic information, uh, they can then decide if it's useful or not. You know, viruses are being exuded from bacteria and fungus and multicellular organisms in response to stressors as well. So it's not just me, right? Like I said, if I'm stressed out, I pass that information on. But there's other organisms that can become stressed and they pass that information on as well. Now, if, if life is good and there's no reason for cellular adaptation, there's no pressure for this to occur. If bacteria, however, are living in your gut and you're, you know, you're not purposely trying to kill them with an antibiotic, there's no need for that bacteria to change its genetic material to seek resistance to that bacteria, right? There's no need for that. But if you're taking antibiotics over and over, and this happens in hospitals, by the way, nosocomial infections are rampant, you force these organisms to, to change and adapt. And now you've got superbugs. We can literally be creating the problem. Think of it as a bee's nest. If that nest is undisturbed, it's chill. You can go by it. You can observe it. It's not going to do anything to you. But if you piss it off, you better run, right? Those bees are going to be angry. Now, in the same way, when our internal biome is stressed, whether that's physically, mentally, socially, chemically, what have you, we start to trigger the need for adaptation so we can fix the shit that we're in. I mean, that's literally what starts to happen. And as such, if you're trained to think holistically and look at the bigger picture, if we take a step back of how and observe how everything is working, you could easily start to see patterns that emerge where parts of the planet are very sick. There's high levels of toxicity, pollution, industrial farming practices, and the predictability of epidemics can be uh, can, can become you know obvious. Um, it's not hard to look at how humans are living, the way that we grow food, how we harvest our energy and everything that's involved in that, all the things that we have to do to, to our environment to get our energy, uh, the pollution and the chemicals that we're creating and we're ingesting or exposing to ourselves, and how it's placing a tremendous amount of pressure on the microorganisms that in turn influence our health. 
In fact, Hubei province, which, you know, is basically the epicenter, right? This is where the pandemic started. It has one of the highest toxicity pollution ratings on the planet. And this is as far back as 2010. Scientists found a potential link between the hazard, you know, the hazardous mix of chemicals and air pollutants, particulate matter that's in the air, and death rates in that area. It's well established that cities that have higher levels of pollution, you see higher death rates, you see higher mortality. There's more dysfunctions that occur within those environments. And it's not just air pollution, but farming practices, the way that, again, we grow food, how we treat the soil, that stress, the, the, the stress to the soil or the animals being grown for food, all combined, right? These stressors can cause organisms to exude stress information, exosomes or viral genetic material. And one could imagine that the amount of pressure that these uh, viruses, that these exosomes you know, have, the viral stress, it's certainly possible that the turnover eventually results in a virus that is capable of driving a pandemic. In short, the environment with all the organisms living within it release exosomes and viral genetic material as a way of communicating the, you know, the environment to, to other organisms. And if our system is out of balance, we can be in an abnormal, unhealthy relationship with these genetic bits of information and a number of symptoms can emerge. And that's when we, what we call sickness, right? A true infection. Now, it's obvious that humans who get a SARS-CoV-2 infection can become critically ill, but there's also humans who get infected and nothing changes for them. What happens here is that for humans are not imbalanced or if they're in harmony with, harmony with their environment if their physiological systems are healthy, these genetic bits of code can integrate into our bodies and uh, that in turn results in a global resilience within the population. Influenza is a really good example where as influenza passes through the world, uh, we, we see all sorts of immunity, not just to influ influenza, but uh, all sorts of other infections. Now in this manner, there's a seasonality, right? Where animals or organisms can get updates from the environment and this can cross the planet. And, and this allows for successful adaptation and resilience of the human species and the friends, the microorganisms that we all live on this planet with. Now, this is what happens when a particular infectious virus becomes endemic. You know, basically it becomes part of us and no big deal. Ultimately, we need to realize that fighting a virus is not the answer. It's the opposite of that. The illogical idea that viruses are the problem doesn't make sense if we just look at the sheer number of viruses that exist. I mean, just take a minute to think about this. In the air that I'm breathing right now, there's an estimated 10 to the 31 viruses. That's 10 with 31 zeros behind it. That's how many viruses are literally in the air that I'm breathing. In the soil that you go and you play around in, that your kids should be playing around in, um, in the masks that you've been wearing this entire last year, there are literally you know, millions, quadrillions, uh, your mask is saturated with a vast amount of viruses. And these bits of genetic information are swimming and interacting with everything on our planet and also with you. Right now, I've got 10 to the 13 or even 15, depending on the reference that you want to use, viruses in my body. Why am I not dead? Why am I not sick? We should not be fighting viruses. Rather, we should be improving the environment both external, my living, external living environment, my house, my home, the, the, the road that I live on, the soil that my house is on, we should be improving the external environment. And we should also be working on our internal environment and creating resilience for our bodies and strengthening our bodies ability to coexist in this environment as a crucial component to survivability. Rather than asking what virus is causing a particular problem, we should be asking what has changed in our environment that is stressing the ecosystem, which includes viruses and bacteria and fungus, et cetera, and how it all negatively or positively influences human relationships with these viruses. Polio is actually a really good example. 
Um, even the CDC says this, I mean, go to their website, 70% of all polio infections are asymptomatic. That's pretty interesting. Certainly there are people who get polio and develop paralysis, which is the worst part of it. But just like there's people who get SARS-CoV-2 and you know, obviously get critically ill and have life-threatening injuries, there are people who don't suffer those injuries. Why? Because of the environment, both internal and external. When it's not the virus, again, it's it's you know the environment. Uh, when you look at the thirty percent of individuals who end up becoming symptomatic from a polio uh, virus, you find uh, or infection that there there are strong relationships between internal toxic load. Uh, this is well established in, in in the literature. Things like DDT that were released, you know, as the savior of chemicals that they would spray, literally spray down neighborhoods. And where you had higher concentrations of DDT being sprayed, you happen to have more symptomatic cases of polio at that time. Uh, there were also instances where there were people that were drinking contaminated public water. Uh, this was water with lead, you know, prior to when we banned lead or where there was heavy metals and other compounds. Um, this is not controversial, by the way. We know that the, the, the increase incidence, just like it's not controversial that uh, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't do so well, you know, with somebody who has type 2 diabetes or heart disease or these chronic health conditions, well, people with polio, don't, they don't do so hot whenever they, they have contamination. Um, and the combination of these things are what result in problems. Now, when you look at individuals who are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, we know there's a strong connection, like I just said, between kidney disease, diabetes, heart health, and the severity of infections. Turns out that people who have these chronic health conditions are likely taking compounds or prescriptions that upregulate ACE2 receptors. And guess what happens when you have a virus that infiltrates the body via ACE2 receptors, and you're also doing something to upregulate them? Uh, it, it's not going to turn out so well. Now, this is something that nature never intended. You know, na nature never intended for us to be purposely upregulating ACE2 receptors because of some, you know, chemical compound, a prescription. Nature never intended for us to be stressing the soil with glyphosate, killing off the microorganisms that, that allow for detoxification of soil, that allow for nutritional uh, diversification of our soil. Nature never intended that. And so when a virus comes into contact with this unnatural situation, you're going to get some crazy shit that starts to happen. And adding insult to injury, if we have contaminated water systems with glyphosate and antibiotics and trace amounts of pharmaceuticals, which is just crazy, the EPA has come out stating that in our public water, right, just water that comes out of your faucet, there are trace amounts of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, antidepressants, blood pressure medications, cholesterol lowering medications, all, you name it. We have this interesting unnatural scenario where a virus that is updating our body, it just doesn't end well. So here we have a situation where a coronavirus that's stressed mutates and travels and enters a host, humans, and allows for updates to occur. There's two situations. One is where the human takes that information in, and if that information has balanced biology, and if that human, that host is in harmony with its environment, it integrates that information, and that human becomes more resilient to its environment. The other situation is where there's disharmony in that host, whether it's by dysfunctional physiology, due to poor diet, to inadequate nutrient status, years of disrupting the microbiome because of antibiotics or other prescription drugs, imbalanced physiology, right? All this up, you know, taking drugs that upregulate ACE2 receptors, toxic load or all of it together, they suffer from it. They suffer immensely from it. But again, it's not the virus. It's the environment that we're living in or the things that we're failing to do to successfully live in harmony uh, with that environment. I really do hope that this message finds you well. I hope that this message acts as a sort of digital exosome, some digital information that can be transferred, you know, through the interwebs and into your body and into your mind, and that it helps you to uh, adapt in a positive way, to adopt maybe, you know, healthier, more meaningful ways of life. 
uh, in, in a successful way towards a healthier future. Now do, go do good things. <laughs>